please help me in welcoming Tatiana. We're so happy to have you. Take it away. Thank you. Hi. Um, oh, it's the first time that I hear my bio read out loud. Well, of course, like it was read while it was being made, but uh, it, it's, it's exciting. I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, um, um, I'm very excited to have everyone here at the studio. Um, I have a very uh, different, I don't know, maybe different practice, but uh, because of my background, I started as a graphic designer and illustrator. Uh, I've been carrying a lot of those, that methodology that I learned in my practice. Uh, I worked for 14 years um, as a designer, so uh, a lot of the ways in which I worked are informed in that, and, and the fact that I used to do a lot of animation and the way that I compose my project, I feel that in a way I, I'm kind of dreaming that I will animate them eventually, that I would also be able to add animation into the composition, into the pieces that I do. Um, uh, right now, I haven't gone that direction because I still get very stressed as I relate uh, motion with my uh, um, practice with clients uh, and I've been exploring all of the other um, all of the things that you're going to see. Um, so I'm going to share with you a video of um, that I did of the exhibition at Sugar Hill Children's Museum um, and as I said this uh, it's going to um, be able to um, share the breadth and scale of the of the of the work and um, and then I will walk you around the studio and and and, uh, and then we'll come back to my computer and I'll share with you some of the Tatiana, I have yeah. a quick question for you. Um, sometimes there's some background noise. I don't know if that's yeah, your... Yeah, it's your... my studio mate. She is uh, okay. right now working. I'm no sorry. Problem. Yes. No problem. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't... Yeah, I am so sorry. Yeah, she, she's sewing. Um, totally fine. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I, will, like, I will give you a little peek into her studio as well. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Todo esto está lleno de mensajes. Yo creo que los árboles le hablan a uno. Pues me están diciendo que están felices. Me están diciendo que están agradecidos de que nosotros los quedamos. So um, can you hear me or is the sound distort, like, distorting my, my voice? We can hear you. Okay, great. So um, the voice in the video, it's a conversation. So 
one of the things that I started a few years back is that I wanted to understand why I was so drawn to nature and why it was so important for me to be having this conversation around nature. And, and that was not only uh, rooted in my experiences as a child in Colombia, um, uh, but it also had to do with, uh, with my dad and his relationship to, to, to the land. And um, especially to to the house where he lives, uh, where he a few years back uh, uh, was able to purchase a very small land who was completely deforested. And then for 25 years, he's been in the process of reforesting with native trees. And it's been incredible to see what has happened. So what he is uh, expressing there is how he communicates with, with his trees, how he, um, feels that there's a dialogue and a conversation, how the trees are telling them, telling him that they're grateful and in exchange, he's also grateful for seeing what's happening in, their, in, in, in his land. Um, I get from him, uh, you know, every week photographs of the new spiders, the now there's some squirrels uh, of the, of the um, there's a, there was an owl, like two owls that came he, they, he, Kim and his wife give them names. It's like, it's, so it's this constant uh, sort of a very uh, entangled relationship with, with his house. And that for me has, a, has something that has become very meaningful. And when I go there, I feel, I feel very at home and I connect as well. Um, I also, we, I, when we, when I was young, um, one of the things that we used to go was going in trips around the country and one of my dad's uh he was a parent of one of the kids that i went to school with uh, but he became very close to my dad he would open a map of colombia close his eyes and drop his finger in an area of the map and then that's where we would end up going and this implied that we would be going to places where there was no gas stations so we needed to pack gas in like a, in a trailer, or food, uh, everything, and just go. And I, I always shared the story that was amazing, but uh, he would say like, today we're gonna stay in a five, uh, in a five star hotel. And I'd be like, oh, oh, yay, super excited. And then all of a sudden, everyone would make a circle with the cars and he was like, take out your, your little mattresses and we would all sleep in the road. And the reason why this is so important is because you cannot do that in Colombia anymore. Uh, and there was a very clear moment in which that was not a possibility where traveling outside, like traveling within the country became extremely, extremely dangerous for everyone. And, and also those communities that live in those rural areas have been under a uh, in, like for many years under incredible um, pressure and violence uh, that has happened in the country. So all of that has like, has had an impact in the land and an impact in the communities. But at the same time, some of this, uh, uh, this war that has happened for Colombia is one of the countries that has been the longest in war. It's, had, it's been in war for about 60, 62 years um has also created that um there's also some things that have come out of it that are very strange and um and then i we i will go back further in that in terms of the color but for example some of the areas where a lot of the guerrilla groups uh would be those areas were able to be uh, uh be very conserved and are some of those the places with some of the most incredible biodiversity and 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 richness in 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 the land because no that it has not the lands haven't been taken to be exploited or or put in and or taken down the trees so there's there's a very complex and complicated history in the country that somehow has created some very negative things but in then in the other hand some things that are positive and that 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 those two extremes are very strange to navigate um especially for me who, who i am somebody that did not grow up in these areas who grew up in the city 
somehow shelter from what was happening there, but still with an impact of what happened in the country uh, in terms of uh, that impact of the violence and not being able to, to experience the country in the way that I experienced it as I was a child. Um, so I, I'm gonna now gonna pin like this, the, the video. Okay, and then I'm gonna walk around the studio. So welcome, this is the space. I am in the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, and uh, um, it's been my home. Hey, my Tiana. Home home. Yes? Just one quick thing. I'm gonna actually, I think, try and make you um, a co-host so that you can do, you can do the um, pinning. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, is it working? Can you see well, it? Um, we can, but I think but students have to, um, uh, well, they have to actually, sorry, they have to choose it. And so I'm going to, okay, I've made you the co host. Now try pinning it. Okay, let me see. But it's okay, remove pin, and then I'm going to try again. Wait. Um, where is it? Okay. Can you see it now? Is it? Is it pinning for you guys? Is it like the main view? The studio? I can't see. I can only see you. Okay, I'm pinning now. Now, can you guys see it? I think I did it by myself. I just yeah. I bet you would pin mine. Okay. Thing. All right. Yeah. So I, I just like right click pinned. Right, exactly. So if someone's not seeing it, go to the blue a dot, the blue square in the upper right hand corner, click on those three dots, and one of the options will be to pin the video. So pin the the square, obviously, that's of her studio. Got it. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Just want to make sure you have full visual okay. access here. Okay, go so ahead. So is Thanks. it working? Yeah. Everyone's seeing this? Okay, great. So um so I've been uh, for five years in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I love it, but I especially love the space. It's the space which I moved in last year. And one of the things that for me was very special when I went about the space is that I found it. Tatiana, it's a little hard to hear you. Oh. Let me do something. It, yeah, it just sounded better for a second. Give me one second. Okay. So when I go away, it, you don't hear it properly? Yeah, it sounds really muffled and kind of, and far mm. away. Okay, so. Um, I wonder, do you know how can I remove the audio from my computer? Mm. Mm. Anyone have any if ideas? I, and then I'll have to uh, log in with the audio and, and hear it. Let me see. Hello? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, so this is gonna work, but uh, something happened right now. So let me see. So now it's working. Is it working? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, 
Um, okay, so what I was going to say, so going back uh, to where I was, um, now I don't know what I did with my, okay, here. So I found this, uh, this uh, beak of, um, of a hawk or an eagle, I don't know, why. it's a hawk, I think. And for me, that was super exciting because it was a way of um, reminding myself that where I'm at, it's a place that once was not this uh, crazy industrial complex that I am now. And it, for me, every time that I see it every day, it's a reminder of where I'm at and the, and the place where I'm, where, I'm, where I'm living and the fact that I am a guest in this, in this place. And I need to be thankful for being welcome, especially the way that the studio has welcomed me. Um, what, I, what you see here in the back, it's an installation that I did for the Wasaic project in 2017. And in this installation, um, um, here's where I kind of want to come back to that idea of the problems of the, of the complicated and complex problems of Colombia. Um, so the, 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 the image and the, and the, and the couch, it's an image that I started doing when I believed I was a true believer that the FARC were some of the, um, uh, some of the problems of deforestation in the country. And by the time that I finished this piece, uh, a lot of articles came out saying that because of how the, how the FARC had been in, in this area and people were not able, like there was not, um, there was the issues where made, basically corporations couldn't come and mine. Uh, a lot of the lands had been preserved. And that's why I started thinking how those problems have always two sides and there's always two sides in, 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 in this, in the complexity of the land um, and, in, in, and in my country. Uh, what I normally do with this installation is that I invite people to come and have tea and uh, have conversations uh, around um, our, our relationship to the land and our experiences and, and share. Um, one of the things that why I started doing it is uh, I started uh, using uh, coca tea, and that was one of the um, what that was one of the the reasons why I wanted to use the coca tea is because since I arrived to the United States, I've been always related with um, there's always the question about cocaine in Colombia, and that question doesn't take into account that. Um, that a lot of the problems of deforestation still today, which it's still a problem, come with uh, come from the uh, plantations of cocaine. And uh, this is one of the it's a coca tea bag, uh, and this piece is all about the coca plant. Oh no! And um, and this is like a series of leaves um, and. Oh, no. Sorry, my, my camera just unplugged. I'm gonna like remove it because I don't know what's happening with the, with the, um, Apologies for that. So uh, one of the things that um, I was always asked was, uh, you know, how good the cocaine is, where can we get it when we go to Colombia? And I didn't have any sense of humor around it. So a lot of the conversations that I wanted to have was like the impact that that, that problem was having in Colombia, not only in people, but in the land. Um, coca, it's a plant that it's um, has extreme, has a very, like a very important value for indigenous cultures. It's considered a, um, it's considered, it's a, it's a sacred plant. And the coca means, uh, it's, it's, it means plant. And it means that the coca is the, it's the connection to the plant world. It's like who gives the people and the person the connection to the plant world. And it also opens 
lines of conversation. So this is a series of pieces that I did around there and uh, around the plant. And one of the things that I that I've been that I've been that I do a lot and I started doing in the residencies because I started realizing that one of the ways in which I learn is by experiencing and by going to the place and learning from the place. So I started most of the things that I've been trying with the residencies that I've been trying to take me to the places that where I think that I can learn further about that relationship with the land. And in here I have uh, an example of the things that I do when I do and do this residency. So I started a practice a practice of doing a collection of photography where I go and photograph very detail all the different uh, uh, aspects of the plant. And I also collect the piece of the plant. So I'll show you when we go back, I will show you a, a little box that I have with all of the with all of the plants. So with that, one of the things that happens is that um, I make sure that I take all the different views and all the details. Like for example, this leaf for me was like super interesting to see how the textures work because for me, they almost look like, like brush strokes. They have like a very particular detail of lines that would work really well to inspire the drawings that I would do. So I, I would do, I would do the, I would do, I would do the, the collecting the plants, the photographs. Um, this is a print that I just did that comes out from, from working, from working with this plant, which is a plant pressing that I collected at my dad's house. And I'm going to show you how it is in the piece that I did. And this is a little bit of all the pieces that I kind of will go around collecting as I'm going and I'm having the process. Um, here I have a series of textures that I used uh, using a piece of branch uh, to create the textures. So I collect a lot of the materials and then I use those same materials to draw and to create lots of textures. I have an a insane quantity of textures and every time that I'm going to start a project, I will, I will start the, a series of, of uh, textures with the land, in the land and um, with, the, with, the, with the elements that I, find, that I find there. Dirt, in this particular case, I was using the sepia ink that I had brought, but a lot of times like this, two textures from here, uh, they're done with a huito, which is a, it's a, it's a natural pigment. Um, that indigenous in the Amazon used to um, to draw in their in their in their body like a body paint. Um, so I so here I can show you a little bit more of different things that I I kind of go collecting. This is my press plant. So here is where I where I press all the plants, and then in the background you can see uh, my studio mates um, work. <laughs> Um, and this box has a lot of the, of the photographs, uh, that I do. And I normally print them in, uh, as Polaroids and then I start hanging them, uh, and hang them around, um, to figure out that I have all of the materials that I need. Um, so, so with that process of doing the textures, collecting the collecting the um, the plants, all of those I will come and digitize. Uh, here I have some more more um, of the different textures. Um, I created this ones here in Brooklyn, uh, and I created them using something that it's called Ambil, and Ambil is is a tobacco paste that is used for um, to chew the coca leaves, uh, to chew the mambe, uh, which is made out of coca leaves. And I I got this uh, in the Amazon uh, when I was there uh, at the end. And I had always thought that I was going to do the drawings with in the place, but I so the community that I spend time with, and I'm going to come back here, uh, and I. A million apologies for what happened. Um, I don't know what necessarily happened with the with my, with my equipment today, um, but um, 
So I spent time uh, in 2019, I decided to do a trip to Colombia. I had never been in the Amazon in Colombia and all the different residencies that I had done had took me to Brazil, to Peru, and I felt very uh, compelled to, um, to go to Colombia. And one of my friends had worked a lot with different indigenous communities and um, I toggle on them uh, to, go, to go to a very special place. Uh, and two of the pieces that are in the museum come from that, from, from the family, from being at, uh, La, with La Familia Negedeca, which is a Bora Muina Negedeca community, one of the 62 tribes that still are surviving and live in the, in, in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and when I arrived, to because I had done all these residencies in places that were a natural reserve, uh, you know, controlled by scientists, or um, the other residency that I did was like this woman's farm that she decided that she wanted to do a residency and because she was in Peru, she decided to call it Centro Selva, but it was not necessarily in the rain, like it was in the rainforest, but there was no longer rainforest because of all the deforestation. So when I arrived uh, to, to La Familia Negreca's home, I just came with all of these ideas that I wanted to like collect and do the textures and Gordy was like, you can't touch anything here. You're not allowed to take anything from us. You're not allowed to do anything. And I was, thank you. I'm like, okay, I'm here and I'm here to just, just learn and, 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 and be there. And at the end of the re uh, at the end of of, of um, my stay there, he said, "Okay, I am going to sell you some ambil, and you can use it in your for your work." And it was once I was done, so I kind of kept it. And my idea was that I was going to go back. That these relationships that I started working on are, were relationships that I would continue to build, and I was going to be able to come back last year. And because of the pandemic, I wasn't able. So I started doing this series of textures here at the studio um, because I felt that I needed to just kind of remind myself of that trip and what I had learned. And, and all of these textures are, were used in a piece that I finished about last week. Um, and I can show you photographs of them when I, when I do the share in the screen. Um, so, um, one of the things every time, that, the more that I work on my pride, on my, that I explore more my relationship to my work, I realize um, that what I'm trying to do is constantly, uh, I'm sort of creating map, maps of memory of these places and trying to remind myself how I'm connected with the land and how I behave with the land and hoping that that exploration that I'm doing through my work and going through that process of, of bringing out these things also creates a sense of connection with the people that are seeing them in a way and helps them and helps them relate to the land that there are that is directly below them. Um, as I continue to be longer and longer in the United States, I feel that I grow. Um, I have this fear of like losing my identity or losing that connection to my homeland and to where I come from. And I feel that that's some of the, some of the uh, idea that I'm constantly reminding myself through my pieces of where I come from, what I've experienced and, and that, sensi that sensibility to the land that I was able to build when I was little and try to continue to have it in a place like New York that it's so urban. <laughs> it's so, it's, it's a place where like the plants are just really fighting to get through those cracks, you know, there you see them struggling. Um, and that was one of the things that I started doing this past year was learning, trying to learn more about those plants that are struggling through the cracks and are, are trying to survive and are trying to just kind of show their way. And I think that that's why finding that beak in my studio of a bird, it's just such a reminder of, of what was here before. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, um, I'm going to now cha uh, shift. I'm going to change the pin, right? Wait, here. Uh, replace pin. Okay. 
it's everyone now seeing me or still the yeah. other the other side okay and i'm gonna share um photoshop okay, okay. And, and Oh. Okay, it's that okay, Hi, okay, good. So um, uh, I am gonna share back Photoshop. Um, and um, okay, so um, the way that I start the pieces and it's with a series of photographs and collage. Um, and um, so this is, this is a collage made out of about three photos. Uh, all of these are taken around my dad's house and that's one of the places that I've been trying to focus into just doing the work because I've been finding that that's a, like a very strong connection. I also grew up in that land. So that attraction that I have towards the rainforest, um, it's completely genuine, but uh, anyway, when I go there, I feel completely at home and I relate like I, I relate to everything and the vegetation. I grew up in the more in the Andes, and the 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 landscapes are the 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 land views are very different. They're more intimate. They're everything's like smaller, so it it becomes very intimate and not so. The 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 rainforests are a lot bigger and more intimidating. So I've been wanting to uh, search and work with that intimacy with the land. So this is an initial sketch that I started, and then this is uh, how it ends. Like this is what the piece ends up looking like. Um, and um, so. There's a, as you see, there's many, many layers. Um, within these layers, uh, I'm gonna just start turning off and on things. So you can see each one of the elements, it's an, it's an independent element. Um, but I'm gonna leave this, this um, tree trunk because it's a good example. Um, you see, do you remember those uh, brushes, paint brushes that I showed you over the table? So those are the ones that eventually become the tree trunks. So I scan those pieces and then they become the tree trunks and then I start feeling those with texture. So a lot of the textures that are, see, you see this texture, that's that brown texture that was on top of my desk is this one. So I bring those textures and depending of how I feel that those textures look like, um, they uh, they start uh, they start giving me a sense of you know that texture looks like a like a like the 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 bark of a tree or it looks more like like the texture of the mosses and I go through each one of the elements that uh, plant that I showed you also over the table that is pressed is this plant right here um, um, it's the leaves that I'm using, and I'm gonna zoom in um, so you can see better. But that's a scan of that press plant that then I treated, and then I kind of broke apart and reassembled and broke apart and reassembled to like become the many leaves of the plant, uh, of the tree. Um, so in all of the pieces that I'm doing, I'm not, Re, re, uh, representing or recreating something exactly as it is. Um, 
and that's what I'm calling them maps of memories because I remember how I picked up this plant. My dad was teaching also Joaquin the names of the trees. This is called a mangle sabanero. And I start remembering the names and it's a really good way for me to like trace back what happened, where it happened and how things um, uh, happened. Um, uh, and it's like a way of like creating those stories that then I can share with people. So. I just saw when I was zooming, and I'm gonna zoom back in, um, there was um, the, the spider, and I don't know if um, I will find it again because it was there. But there's a series of spiders, and these are these really crazy looking spiders that, um, oh, here's a, this is one of the birds that, one of the hummingbirds that arrives to my dad's house. Um, and also the scale will never be the same, it's never the same. Uh, the scale varies a lot. Um, yeah, so here's the spider. And and the spider was a very strange spider that arrived to my dad's house. And, and we were very puzzled by it. And then it disappeared and it shows up at the same time of the year every year. And it's a crazy looking spider. This is, you know, so all of the elements that I have, um, they are all of these elements, they like here, they're all created individually, right? So this is the flowers. This is the flower of this plant that is there. So um, I created the flower and then the flower, it's also created by layering those different textures uh, and creating one element, element by element. So I'll go each one of the elements that you'll see, they're created piece by piece, drawn and then uh, brought in together. So, um, and the textures added. So then in here, I brought the flowers and then the flowers are up here. And again, the stems are also done. Each, each leaf is done independently. I layered and then, so it's, just, it's, it's a little bit like if I was working in collage, but collaging my own element. So I create an element and then I repeat and and duplicate and change it and adjust the colors and adjust the contrast. And then once the element is finished, I bring them individually or I've been in together back to the composition and then they're here. Um, and, and then I find where else I want to put them. And, and so in a lot of these, there's a combination of textures that I created class plans and then the photography elements. Um, but the photography elements start more as a base for the for the piece. Um, I was gonna show something fun. So I like creating all this uh, creatures that are hiding. Um, and this is one of my favorite ones because even when I have the piece, I never find it. Uh, and this is a lizard. Um, so in this, this lizard, I'm using one of the photographs. So if you see one of the, like the, the, the skin, it's also created by a layer of a photograph that I took. So I'm, I combine a lot of, a lot of elements to create the pieces um, and, and create these pieces that, that are very immersive and for me allow people to come close. And, and I, what I hope is that they get to experience that same idea of, um, that same idea of, uh, of wonder and curiosity that I experience and that I find that my son experienced that is very child of what, like not feeling afraid of what can be found in nature and connect deeply to it. Uh, I'm gonna stop here. <laughs> Beautiful, Tatiana, thank you. Um, I wanna ask you one quick thing. So when you, so you're creating these natural landscapes, but you were careful to say you're not, did you say you're not creating? What I'm not that? recreating, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, looking into doing a realistic representation of, okay. of the place. Okay. Uh, and I combine, so for example, one of the pieces that I finished, um, it's, it's with a photograph that I took in the Amazon, but the leaves of the tree are leaves that I pressed from a tree at my dad's house. 
Mm -hmm. which is a completely different. So that's what I mean, that they're really like maps of memories. It's almost like I'm combining all these different slivers of memories and places and ways in which I have like this very deep relationship to, to the place and to the land. One thing that when you said that, that made me think something I've never thought before, which is um, what if trees and nature themselves are also remembering what has been before like what if I mean we could talk about that in terms of DNA and genetics but um, even on the plant level but just the idea of like like singing a song again or, or recreate recording something you know that that we as artists especially when we're collaging and bringing different elements together we're making a new whole and like you're anchoring that based in your own past or memory of like even a specific moment and I, the new thought was like, what if plants are doing the same thing and they just didn't know? And they are. Um, you should look into the studies of a woman called uh, Monica Gagliano. Uh, mm. And she does a study. It's incredible to see her, to hear her work, but she has worked with um, the Mimosa Pudica, which is a plant that, that uh, closes in touch. Um, yeah. And so, uh, that, we call it La Dormilona in uh in in colombia but it's a plant that i remember that it was super fun to find because you will come and you'll touch it and the plant will like just go into hiding we call and it she, a sensitive plant uh the what the sensitive plant yes oh, so okay. she does this whole study dropping the plant uh, multiple times and that after certain times of her dropping the plant the plant stops like uh closing down and then she has another study of like uh, what like uh, tr like it's she's super interesting, um, and and she talks about about that language of plants and and in, in plant plant intelligence and it's really really incredible. Wow. So okay. yes, I will totally recommend uh, uh, that that thought because it happens. Yes. Okay. Well, and what I was wondering too is that so you compile you you make these these digital files in photoshop and then when you output them as prints are you do you output them just with your like with your photo printer like they're basically ink on paper oh they oh that's a great question so i print them in canvas uh and then i paint over them oh. so all of the gold is paint over it yeah and when you do you paint over the black and white parts too I do small lines and I think the, the way in which I use the gold, so the gold uh, is used as, you know, reference uh, extractive economies, but it's also reference, referencing the, the wealth of the land. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also, uh, I use also the gold to guide the eye mm -hmm. through the work. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm creating the pieces, I try to create um, connections, you know, and normally where I put the animals right. and you like can find and there's ways in which you can just kind of go in a circular way. Um, and uh, so I, I use that to make the connections and to enhance those details. So for example, where the, where the lizard is kind of hiding, I would add a little bit of gold to just kind of draw the eye and let people come to the piece and, and discover. Mm -hmm. So those pieces at the Brooklyn, at the Children's Museum, the Sugar Hill uh, pieces, those are um, they're printed ink on canvas, but then you've painted on top of them, both the gold yes. and black and white. Okay. Yeah. The, the gold, not the black and white, the gold. Not the black and white. So the black and yeah. white is just ink on, just what the pigment Yeah, that's, it's, the, it's a pigment print on, on canvas. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then the gold is hand painted. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what are the questions do do? do, do, do? I have a process question. Um, well, first, I have to say, like, I'm super fangirling over your whole <laughs> body of work. Because um, it's, I'm very interested in a lot of, like, the nature versus, like, cityscape ideas. So thank you for being a great artist. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, no, I have a process question. You said that you use Canvas 
Um, what are some of the other materials that you actually print on? Do you print on like normal paper or do you do like fabrics? Or I print on I print on on paper. I print on paper. I print on the canvas. Um, I just got that huge printer that you saw somewhere in there. I it's it's a printer. It's not brand new. It's very brand old, but it's new for me. <laughs> so it's very exciting uh, because now I'm gonna be able to have the ability to have more immediacy of what I'm doing and printing it. Um, before that. Um, I would need to just kind of wait for the right moment to print the work uh, when it's gonna be shown. So a lot of times the work that like, for example, the Sugar Hill Children's Museum, I didn't see the work until I arrived to the exhibition and it was all set up. That was the first time that I was seeing the work at real scale. Like I never see any of my pieces in real scale. I always see them very small, you know, like kind of the exercise that I did so to see the whole piece that goes small in my screen and then, so I'm always like very zooming in all the details and then the small piece. Um, so now I'm excited. So I may start printing in more materials and, and experimenting with that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I have a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just based on what you just said, does you go into a project with a certain scale in mind, considering it could since you're working mostly digitally, at least in the beginning, or not the beginning, but putting everything, like collaging everything, it could kind of be scale you wanted. Like, do you go into it with a, with an idea, like a scale in mind? That's a great question. Yes, because uh, one of the things that I do is that I immediately start working at a scale, like I imagine how that piece I would want it to be in real life, right? So a lot of times when I'm doing a tree, I'm, I'm looking to the scale of the tree. So I was doing trees at the scale that they are, you know, like trying to imagine the scale. And the reason why I work like that is because I can always scale down but I cannot scale up. And what I would explain about that, and so a lot of times people, like I had many conversations with uh, printers where they're like, oh, you're crazy printing at that resolution. You can just work half the size and then I'll put bigger. It doesn't work like that because you're, you are literally just kind of pushing the pixels, like you're pushing. So if I want the lines to be really sharp, if I, and you can do just a very simple experiment. It's like you go and do, you draw a line and then you scan it and just scan it at a, let's say you scan it a hundred percent, right? And then you scale it up, you're gonna see how the line distorts, it becomes bigger. So I always am scanning things bigger. So I have all of the information and more details. Yeah. Does that solve your question? Yes, yeah, it does. Because, um, well, I don't usually, I don't work digitally, but it, I feel like that I can understand how that's a problem that you have to solve, you know. And so it's, I was just interested in how you go about go about that. Yeah. Because when you see your works and how large they are, and um, like all the detail and everything you get with them, it they're really like beautiful. So it's, yeah, it's interesting to see how you tackle that problem. Yeah, and, and to answer that as well is that I, I'm imagining like if I were to be a painter and I want to work at that scale, I wouldn't be working smaller, like I would be working at that scale. So I think that I'm seeing my medium not as a way of, of cheating results, but as a way of working as if I was working at the scale. I have a question. Um, you, your work is incredible, um, and it looks like a, a very time consuming, a tremendous amount of time for so much detail and all the layers. How long does it take for you to create one of the landscape pieces? And I know they're probably different, but on average. So that's, yes, it's a very time consuming, like a lot of times when I'm working, I'm like, whoa, why did I choose to do things this way? <laughs> um, so, you know. Let's say like one of the tree trunks that are simple, that I can do like, let's say three hours. But if I were to do like 
a leaf, you know, from the beginning, like those flowers and that plant, that's probably between one to two days. So the first piece that I started doing this way, it probably took me about seven months to do. And one of the things that I started, so I have libraries. So if I show you, I have, you know, I started doing libraries. So I have libraries of all my textures. I have libraries of all my brush strokes uh, by country, by place. And then one thing that I started doing was creating libraries of all of my elements. So I have a folder that is just leaves, a folder that is just tree trunks, the combination of those tree trunks, the tree trunks separate. So that way, when I come to a piece, I'm always using elements from other pieces, but then I'm creating new pieces from the beginning. But I'm, I have decided to allow myself to use elements because otherwise, like I sometimes my 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 husband laughs at me because it's, I it, I I wouldn't I would only create one piece a year basically, if you take into account the time of going to the place, photographing, doing the textures, and I have to say that the textures is one of the things that for me is the most important part because that's what creates the difference in in the work. So a lot of times I do come like the reason why I started doing this and here was because I was yeah. really bored with all the textures that I had been using over the years. I had used them so much and I was so tired. And one of the things that happens is that I start knowing how those textures behave. So I stop exploring. So when I have new textures, I have to re figure out how those textures work and how and what is it that they're going to bring to the work. So that's the part that for me is the most exciting is because I'm just, I'm starting the work without knowing what's going to happen with the textures and if they're going to work or if they're going to do a, be a good result. I have a follow up question to that. And that is, um, Tatiana, do you, um, when you say libraries, do you mean digital libraries or do you mean physical libraries of, of, of like physically drawn things or physical plants or do both? You mean both? Both. Okay. So I have the physical ones, which not all of them have been scanned. And a lot of times I just kind of have to go through and re see and go and see and be like, oh, I never scanned these pieces and these are really nice. Because I kind of like when I'm creating the textures, I sort of like immediately know which are the ones that I'm falling in love with and the ones that I want to work because either it's a texture that looks like the skin of a toad or the skin of a, of, a, of a reptile, or it really looks like the bark of the tree that I was working. So I have certain textures that immediately I'm drawn to and I'm like, okay, this is gonna work. And then there's a texture that I kind of uh, uh, neglect. And sometimes I come back and I was like, oh, why didn't I get it? pay attention to this texture? This is gonna actually work. So yeah, so I have a, a uh, I have files of like the textures also named by the place and yeah. Uh, I have a question about like, I guess your studio. So seeing that you split it with somebody, um, how does, or I guess really just my question is, do you like doing that? Or is it really a matter of just practicality or like, do, do, is that something you enjoy or would you rather have a space, um, a private space for yourself? I, you know, it's very interesting. I would say that this past year it has been, I've, I've been incredible, incredibly grateful for my two studio mates because I normally would find myself very isolated. I have an 11 year old. So I, I think that there's certain things that when you have a family, you stop doing. So it's very easy for me like not to have a very crazy social life because I have excuses not to have it. So when I spend all day by myself in the studio, I'm just in my head. So I'm just like, mm, you know, and I'm creating, but I'm also just like thinking of all the things that I don't need to think, you know, or, and then there's a moment where I'm like, oh, I stopped thinking about all the things that I didn't need to think. But I think that having the energy of other people in the space, it allows you to like, just kind of, I don't know, it fills up that empty space that when I'm alone, it's always very present. And I think that the other part is that financially, it's 
it's very expensive to have your own studio here in New York. So I financially cannot afford to have my own studio. I can, what I can afford is to share. Um, and what I said this year for me has been incredible to have a studio partner. It's, it's been really, really healthy and good. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I wonder, uh, did you always make this type of uh, kind of like evolving collage work? And like, what did your work before this type of work look like? I'll show you. So before that, I used to collect a lot of botanical plates. And the first pieces that I started doing were also digital collage, but um, um, but I was collaging, and, and I can tell you like there's a little story behind it. I was collaging the plates. So those plates were plates that were creating in the 1800s in Colombia by a priest. Uh, that came with colonization and um, I just find that I was I, one of the things when I started doing these pieces was commenting and the fact that colonization happened then the priests came and they were doing all these studies of the plants uh, naming the plants with their names and all of these were uh, uh, plants that are, have already been that were not discovered by them they were not the people who like it was it's just very ironic and it's also all of this was created to create commerce and to start this idea of um of extracting from the land so for me that's very tied with the pro with the current problems that we have of uh, uh um environmentally is that idea of thinking that this the lands that were being discovered were to exploit um and that relationship to the gold so like colonizers will come and they wouldn't understand why the coca plant was more important for uh indigenous people that gold that they will like put themselves gold and throw the gold in the lake um so i started collaging those plants and um because I was still, when I was, when I started my work explorations, uh, one of my clients was on that uh, channel. And at, the, at that time, they had a, um, they had a sun, uh, green on Sundance and they were asking people to create animations that will speak about the environment. And um, they had seen like the, the, because they were my clients, they knew my work, they invited me to do a piece. And when I had to do the piece, one of the things, because it was going to be displayed on TV, I was not allowed to use any imagery that didn't belong to me or that it was not copyright free. And, and that's when I started the process of figuring out how to do the drawings. And I basically, I was like, oh, I would love to be a painter. And, but I didn't have the skill, like not that I didn't have the skills, but for me, it just seemed, really crazy to try to get into a painting class to like try to like do something so I started trying to create all these textural elements that will feel very painterly and like this brush strokes that I could then scan and bring and I'm happy that I did because it's it's different than it's a, something that I feel that I can really own uh, and it's not like you know I could tell you that I have all the steps but it's not like they're um, like everything comes out the same. Every time that I do new and new piece, the piece comes out completely different. Like it's not like one looks the same as the other. Overall, they all live together well, but I never have the same results. So that's where I started initially, but it's always been very based in collage idea. And when I was in school, I used to do a lot of hand-drawn illustration. Um, now when I see it, I don't think that I was that good. You know, I felt that maybe I was good, but <laughs> things happen. Maybe that's why I'm not an illustrator anymore, you know? Um, you kind of touched on this briefly, but I was uh, thinking about how does um, the colonization show up in your work and kind of like, are, are there references that we should be aware of it within um, your it's not, you know, I think um, 
It's not, it's not very, I would say that the, uh, the place where you see it the most evident, it's in the, well, there's in a few things. Um, the furniture pieces, for me, furniture is a very, um, at least in Colombia, furniture, it's a, it, there's a very strong link between furniture and uh, your uh, ancestry with place. So, and also not also ancestry with place, but relationship to class and class is very tied into um, colonization. And basically if uh, some like your family, like that person's family, my family can connect their ancestry to Spain and to the crown. And then that has more, you, that, that has a much more value. And I think that um, there's been an erasure of that indigenous ancestry and and um and for me that furniture has been that link to that it's like they like people want to have that piece of furniture that has that connection somehow or like it's the piece of furniture that was passed from the great grandmother to the great grandfather and and also like the material that is done in that furniture has a history of exploitation so that for me that piece of furniture it's something that for me it's a reminder of of of, of that colonization um also because i started using and like uh, the idea of engraving so the black and white uh and i and i heard that you were talking about the black and white and the relationship with cheche um so i i'm glad that you brought that but i started uh with the black and white as making a uh, reference to the those um engravings that colonizers had done and how they used to see um, the, 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 um, the Americas, you know, and how they used to depict these places as like exotify them. So in a way that idea of continuing to see the imagery in a way that it feels old is thinking about how the, the place was seen by somebody else, by the other that came and saw it. And also making a reminder that a lot of these places are still being colonized and are still, the, a lot of the effects of colonization are still happening in a modern way. Um, and that is by uh, corporations, by NGOs, there's, there's still things that are happening in the land that have the same effects, like colonization hasn't stopped in South America. And then going to the concept of Cheje, which is a concept that I very recently found and for me has been just kind of transforming. Um, it's because um, I, I've always been like a lot of times people have asked me, why do I work in black and white? And I'm not working in black and white. Like there's so much color within the piece. There's so much contrast. But at the, thing, at the same time, what I love from hearing that concept of Cheje and how those tensions and how the, the diversity and the, and, the, and the result of that combination of the black and white is it's, it's what it brings. It's, it's what it like creates that difference. That difference is what it needs to be um, it like, acknowledge and it's what it is important and all those difference that we all kind of carry and for me that was very important to think about all those problems and the, the complexities that uh, Colombia has and those tensions of those complexities that are seen through the land and through culture are what it forms and what it becomes very rich in the culture as well. I do have a question. Um, I watched the videos about um, Silvia Rivera, and I heard when she said that she had that um, kind of rituals where she talks with the rocks or the river to connect with the nature. Do you do that kind of things? <laughs> <laughs> Connected? <laughs> Yes, I do. I do. I do. I do that a lot. I talk to the plants a lot. Um, I have conversations with the birds that I hear every day uh, in my studio. Like if I arrive and they are chirping, I say hello and I thank them for being here. Um, um, I, I, it's harder 
in New York for me to kind of have those conversations, but I have them with my plants at home. I am constantly talking to them. I've also had felt that a lot of them, I started kind of relating some of them with some of my friendships and, and complexity with some friendships and how some are easy. And, and I don't know, I started making parallels at some time. I don't know why, but I, I enjoyed that. It made me feel that I needed to like see each one of them differently and behave with each one of them differently, that I couldn't just water them the same way or just treat them the same way because somehow they are uh, unique. Uh, a lot of times I see that they're smiling. I think that I feel that they just, that I, sometimes I sit and I feel that they are express, expressing gratitude and they smiled. And uh, with a friend, uh, she has noticed that when I leave home and I leave the plants, they just kind of get sad. And when I come back, they immediately change their behavior. So I do think that, you know, it's not as intense as like my, like I think that I'm still in the process of trying to develop more of that language and create more rituals. Um, I feel that I may have rituals in my life that I'm not very conscious of them. And I've been trying to figure out how to become more conscious of those rituals, even within my process of working and as I see my process of working, embracing that ritualistic part of it as something that is connecting me to the work, to the work and to the land and being more aware of that. I think that the word ritual, uh, as it happens to me when you grow up in a Catholic country, the word ritual, it's a little bit distorted maybe. Uh, for That's for me where I never heard it as something that was positive and more as something that was uh, like pagan, you know, or weird, without even realizing that the same rituals that, let's say, my grandma had of like waking up and praying and going through this process was a ritual on it, on its own. Um, but but um, I think that those that idea of the ritual that you have that I can have, it's been very excited for, exciting for me to like understand, especially when I'm also doing the work of collecting or having those conversations. Um, there is another woman. Uh, her name is uh, Robin Welkimer. I don't know if uh, it has come up so, um, for you or for any of you. But um, she talks a lot about that conversation uh, with the with the land, and it's very beautiful. She's Native American, and that's that's one thing that I cannot say that I embrace because for me it's still something that I'm trying to figure out. How is it that I'm giving back to the land where I'm taking, and what is the negotiation that I'm doing, and what can I start doing to create a better dialogue when I'm collecting the elements that I'm collecting and being more conscious of that process. Um, I think that I'm like, and even though I'm having the dialogue, I think that because I'm not conscious about it and making it as a, 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 a conscious idea of what I'm doing, um, that's something that I want to bring more in my practice when I'm, when I'm, in the, when I'm outside and I'm, I'm doing that, I'm doing the process. Thank you. Uh, after watching the videos of Silvia, I was kind of curious if you understood or talked any Quechua or Aymara. I don't know. I don't. I, because I'm not from Bolivia, I hardly know any of the languages from uh, for the indigenous language from Colombia. I would want to uh, learn more Muisca, you know, and more of the languages that are closer to where I grew up and start more of an acknowledging process to those um, and learning more about those, those, the, that, that um, civilization that was wiped out um, and, or still there's some people there and learn more about that. Um, but she's inspired me to like, uh, just try to find that connection that has been constant, that I think that has been gone through a very large erasure uh, in Colombia. And I definitely saw the the Cheje connection in your art, by the way, to her metaphor of the- Oh, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That's so cool. Yay. <laughs> I love hearing that. Another question. 
Oh, sorry, Jillian. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was uh, wondering if this is something you think or worry about, because I think about it a lot. Um, do you feel like your work, like the physical work, um, is inspiring in people or in corporations, like the changes you want to see? Um, not just in Colombia, but like anywhere that this is a this is an issue. And just like, I don't know, I don't have much experience in the art world outside of school. And I just wonder if there's this like, disconnect between the work and the reason you make it or is it okay just being like part of a smaller part of like this big movement you know what I mean um yes I know what you mean uh and um I have experience so I and I can just tell you a few stories that have touched me a lot and I think that that's when I see that the work it's creating those connections. So when I was painting the pieces at the Sugar Hill Children's Museum, one of the persons that worked at the museum came to me and we started talking about one of the, uh, the trees that were in, in one of the pieces. And he was from um, some of the Caribbean islands. I can remember, I think there was St. James. And he started talking, he was like, there's this tree. And I was like, oh, that's not that tree. But I actually found out about that tree, which that right now I want to do, like, I need to draw that tree because that, came, that tree came in conversation with another artist here, which is it's called uh, El Arbol de Pan. And it's the tree that has been brought with colonization to, and I, I, I was seeing this tree all through the Amazon and I'm photographed it and I love the textures on the tree trunk and there's this like gigantic fruit and then I came really excited to find out the tree and then one of the assigned like one of the persons that an anthropologist that I know was just like well that tree is not from the Amazon it was introduced and then that tree came out in conversations with this person where he started telling me stories about his grandmother and how they used to take the fruit and the sap of the fruit and they used to chew it and and he had all this connection to the tree. And for me, that was very interesting. It was, and I think that that's what I hope. And that's why I'm not necessarily wanting to uh, portray the place exactly as it is, but insert things that have also maybe been collected here. So I would hope that, that it creates some connection uh, I just put some pieces at, at this place, Brookfield, and they were doing a small film. And when they were doing the film, one of the persons walked by and said, like, hey, I'm from Bogota, good work. And and he like he was just excited about, like, he was like, where are you from? And I'm like, Bogota. He's like, me too. And so I feel that for me, one of the things that is exciting about doing public art is that, yeah, some people may just walk by and not even be touched by it. And those people are really hard to get, but who knows what's in their mind, what they're thinking. And I'm sure that they would also have a hard time even seeing the, the little flower that is coming up in the, in the, in, in the ground. And, but, um, but I'm hoping that maybe after like a person passing through the same work, something starts getting in there. Um, the large corporations, I, I, you know, I, I, it's so complicated. Everything that's going on is so complicated that I'm okay with being a small voice because I think that if there is a lot of small voices, then that becomes one larger voice. But I don't think that I want to try to, I don't know, like, I think that it, it's where I'm right now and, 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 and I'm okay with where I'm right now. Thank you. I was going to ask um, Tatiana a question about the about language um, and, and colonization. I was thinking about the reading or just about what Sylvia's work is and, and the way that she's calling out, you know, English as and even Spanish as like um, as as acts of colonialism or as even tools of furthering colonialism. And I really loved that, you know, even just like within a single article or conversation, she'll switch through different languages. And um, I was wondering if you think about that in your own work, especially in the way that, like in your process, literally the way that you're not taking things literally, you know, the way that you're creating, like copying, 
adjusting, recreating, collaging, we could just say, like, is there any connection there for you in a kind of visual language um, or, or a awareness around like, not that what, that how we see um, and what we see can determine our thinking. And I just wondering if that's part of like your process as well. It's interesting, you know, I, I think that I see the, the, if I see the process, my process, that's where I see it as a visual language because I'm dyslexic and I have such a hard, like I learn so much. That's why I've organized and I create all of those different systems. It's because I forget words very easily. And I think that a lot of these elements help me tie in concepts that I can forget. So somehow I may be assigning concepts to the textures and to the elements. And then as I use my own piece, the pieces to like kind of navigate and explain, that reminds me of moments that if I wouldn't have the pieces, I wouldn't remember. And I would just kind of lose the connection. I am constantly shifting between English and Spanish. And it's very interesting when I hear, by being in the United States, I know that you know Spanish is a language of colonization, but I, for me, it's been very strong, the fact of, if you go to Colombia, um, you will find people trying to speak English. Like you will find people trying to speak the language of the person that is coming or trying to learn other languages, right? To whoever comes welcome. I have found very harsh the fact that in the United States, there's not that encouragement towards other languages. And for me, even though like Spanish is like a colonized language as well, I f and that's where I speak about all the ways of colonization, I feel that I had very strong feelings about, for example, Dora the Explorer and how a cartoon is used to like teach children English, but not necessarily teach the American kids Spanish in the other way. And it's used and is manipulated in that way. Um, and I feel that that I, I, I find it a lot stronger, uh, the, the fact that I have never encountered, I have encountered very little people that would try to speak Spanish or would try to go further and to understand what I'm saying. And that I've had to like work really hard to like wipe off my, my accent so I can be understand, like I can be understood like the, all of these things, uh, especially more when you're working professional, when you're in a professional place. Um, and so it's, it's interesting because it's become, um, I, 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 I would love to start incorporating, or I know that in Spanish, there's a lot of Muisca words, like in Bogota, a lot of Muisca words and indigenous words that have like stayed in the language. But I would want to know more consciously which are those words and try to go back and learn more of the language. Um, and I've started just to just speak freely in Spanish when I am not being capable to speak in English uh, in a way or just uh, sign the email in Spanish because I can never sign an email in English because I don't know what's the right way to sign it. And I it and it's very different um how you know all oh, the best for me there's ways in which the emails that i'm saying i don't mean to ridiculize anything like i'm not not being disrespectful but for me it's so much nicer say i you know un saludo grande o un saludo it's that it's there's a lot of words that for me are so much more warm and comforting um that I, at some point I was like, why I'm not using those words that I identify with and that are easier for me to, um, to use. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had a question, um, trying to figure out how to word it so it makes sense. Um, so I know that the way that you depict earth is, you know, it's in a very ethereal way that kind of, you know, I can see the direct influences that you use from, you know, Colombia and more, what's the word, more like 
naturalistic Amazon kind of environment. So my question is, I lived in Manhattan for a long time. And um, obviously there's ways to go outside when you live there and see greenery and see earth, but it's in a much different way. And so I guess my question is, how do you use what you see in the world around you specifically? And how does that reference transform into the earth? Does that make sense? You cut off a big chunk of what you were saying. Can you, so how, so I got into like, so, so sorry. Um, I got oh, into where fearful. like, how, how do I, um, I, I heard until you say, okay, how do I trans? So let me see if I can fill out the space. So you're trying, you're wondering how okay. my daily life in New York, how do I transform that relationship to the land being in New York? And how do exactly. I connect yeah. to that? Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. so I've been starting like, this is, you know, I've been 21 years in New York and I would say that one of the things that the pandemia has brought is trying to understand that, like really trying to understand that because I would, for, for the past four years, I would be, I would go off for two months into the rainforest. I would go somewhere. And um, because somehow the East Coast landscape and the United States landscape is so different than the landscape in Colombia. Colombia is like so complex and so complicated and so intricate, it's so disorganized that I always feel like, I think that that's when you know what place you belong to because you relate to the landscape in a way that you're like, ooh, that's kind of my personality, you know? Like, like I, I am complex and tangled kind of, just unpredictable and and I think that that's how the landscape in Colombia works it's just it's just it's just complicated and just full of things and like one little thing there's like a million plants a million uh, it's 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 oof, it's complexity at so at all and I've met with people that that are more uh, uh, related to the landscape in the desert and they're so they have a such a different way of being in around the world and things so it's very interesting um so in terms of new york i always felt like every time that i go to like you know the the forest around here i find them extremely organized i find everything extremely organized in any part of the united states and i well not any part but i i still haven't gone to all the part of florida and the Everglades and 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 maybe all the south. I'm kind of wanting to do that, um, but and I was just like, oh, I, I can't see this. So I'm just need to go to Colombia because I don't know how to behave. This is way too structured. But I think that that's one of the things that I I feel that I you I don't need to go. Like one of the things that it's become very present is that. Being in the city doesn't mean that you're excluded from nature. Like the city, one of the first concepts that I, and me as a person that I've been having to just, just tell myself, it's like, I am in nature. It's just right now has been plastered with cement, but it's still there. And I think that when the pandemic happened and the weeders were not happening, I started seeing all of these plants that were just growing wildly and then there's bees in the navy yard which is an industrial concept and there was a cricket that I would see every time that I was going out so I just just felt that I just needed to be paying attention really just pay attention to even those small things and and just maybe not be constantly looking at my phone and just just be present to what it is because I think that um I don't know I feel that all the technology and the way that cities work uh, just prepare you to like not be present, like to give you warnings, right? And not to really think of how you navigate the places. Like if you're, if I'm in the Amazon, I can't be with my phone. No, I need to be looking where I'm placing my food. I need to be looking like, and I just want to be looking. So I think that when you're in the city, 
like you're just like I'm walking and the car is going to honk at you if you don't stop in the sign or the sign like you know or some but it's it's just I feel that what I realize is that I need to find that sense of presence in the city is the same way that I will have that sense of presence in nature and then I'll start kind of connecting and I've been trying to learn a lot more about about what used to be below Brooklyn, below Manhattan, which used to be extremely diverse and 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 there was a lot of like plant life and wetlands. Um, uh, and I want to find more about that. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes, right. thank you. So we're just at about um, 30 on our end. Is there one last question from anyone? Okay. Tatiana, thank you so much for, or is there, Tatiana, is there anything else you want to say? Anything no, you left out? Okay. Thank you so much. All the questions were incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot from this process and from all of the questions that you did. It's always uh, it makes me think about how I'm speaking about the work, how I'm speaking about the subjects that I want to speak. And so thank you. It's very important. All the questions are very, very important. So thank you for, for thank asking them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.